Hey, people, well, thanks for being here, and thanks for your interest in the uh, Voyager around the world. You know, we never went more than 25 or 30 flight test hours without a mayday malfunction of some kind or another. How in the world are we going to go 10 days? I thought, you know, I looked around, and this wasn't, nobody was paid for anything. People lost their jobs and come and volunteer for the project. And I thought, you know, if we go out and do an Amelia Earhart disappearing out over the, out over the ocean, There's a lot of people on this team that's going to feel really bad. So I come up with a plan. We're going to run it. I call it a death tape. Yeah. And I set the, set the camera up on the tripod, right looking down one of the runway. It's kind of a Cecil B. DeMille thing. And I told my manager to start the camera, and I wanted him to leave. And Gene and I walked into frame, looked in the camera, and the plan was to call all the volunteers together and play on this tape. And the tape said, number one is, do not disgrace this program like the Challenger did by the survivors of those brave astronauts. The survivors wouldn't sue the company, sue the country that they gave their lives for. They couldn't imagine anything so selfish and hideous. And the message was, nobody, we all knew this was dangerous and all knew this was a challenge. This is nobody. If anybody sues anybody over any aspect of this, Gene and I will come back and, and we will uh, to you and your grandkids. Don't do that. And the second message was, and it says, none of you should first of all feel sad because you may have done something wrong, and I know you did. Everybody came here on this day at this time and did their very best to do something really significant. And it didn't turn out right this time, but that's not, that's not something you should be ashamed of. You should be damn proud that you came here and did this. So don't go away sad about this. We all knew what the risk was. And then we turned around and walked down the runway and just kind of faded off. Never had to play that tape, anybody. I wonder what the next five minutes of my life is going to be like. Now, rightfully so, reasonable, any reasonable person, but if I unlocked the canopy and walked out in the desert, you could probably live for another day. <laughs> but as soon as those volunteers caught up with him, there would be, and rightfully so, premature euthanasia for some coward that totally deserved it. And there was no getting out of it. There was no way. You had to go. That one reprieve right at the end. Now, this airplane had more fuel in it and the boom tanks were bent down and that, they twisted the wings in the wrong direction. And that's why the wings flew down, not up. So don't ask me why I didn't put a skateboard on the wing tips, because they were supposed to fly up, not down. But the extra weight twisted it and we all missed it. One thing when I was trying to put the canopy in, because it, it fits in from the inside. And, and I pushed it up and put it in and the fuselage was twisted so much that it wouldn't fit. I reached up there and I tried to force it in and it wouldn't force in. And now, you talk about mixed emotions. <laughs> hey, if this doesn't fit, I don't have to die today. <laughs> but then I thought, well, maybe I ought to hit it. it was, the psychology of this is really funny. I'm holding it up and I'm trying to pound it with my right hand to pound it in place. And my arm wouldn't work. I couldn't make my arm hit the thing. Because I thought, if this thing pops in, you're going to die figure that out. And then with a big gulp and figured it out, pow, and it went in. Damn. So I locked the canopy, and here we go. Brother Bird said, if you're doing there, I have 68 knots by midfield, you got to abort. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, no, Dick, it's really important, because if you don't have 68 knots at midfield, you're not going to make it. And with no brakes, just a little tiny nose wheel brake and max power reverse, you may be able to get it stopped the next half of the runway. Promise me, yeah, yeah, Bert. But Bert did not know that after five and a half years, I was fed up with this thing, I was totally tired, and I wanted nothing more than to have the darn thing over with. Then focus. Well, I passed midfield and we were four knots low and I called four knots low, nobody said anything. I think everybody else knew I wasn't going to board anyway. 
I came out here to fly around the world and I didn't care if I was on fire where we were going to go. With 95% of the world's longest runway consumed, and right at Mac minimum liftoff speed, I reached down on the controls and I said to myself, Dick, if you've never been smooth at any time in your life, this is a big one. And frankly, I didn't even think I could fly it because of the deterioration based on gross weight of the flying qualities. See that? That's the ILS Glide School antenna on the other end of the runway. <laughs> Mm. Come on, baby. Come on. Airborne. The funny thing is airborne. Could not believe it. It's in ground effect. Now can we accelerate to our time speed in ground effect? And it did. As we cross it, God, what are those wings been? Oh. <laughs> so we crossed the end of the runway, actually got 100 knots. I called 100 knots to Bert, and he says, wow, they got 100 knots, they got 100 knots. Wow, I didn't think they did. Great to of those wings been. Ah, scary. Anyway, we started climbing. How much climb did we have? And I says, if I had 50 foot a minute, I would be I would be thrilled, right? 50 foot a minute ready to climb. I mean, you talk about being extremely overgross. We did not have single engine capability on this airplane until we got to the Philippines, by the way. <laughs> um, see, just trying to go through these big canyons. We spent most of the day, didn't turn the oxygen up enough. Both of us became extremely hypoxic, didn't even know it. Jane had passed out, and I had a hard time keeping her away. I had hallucinations of it with the instrument panel bulging out. And I was trying to hold it in with one hand and fly the airplane with something else. We are in really bad shape. I'd go down to can of Canyon of Thunderstorms and it block and I'd turn around and have to fly all the way back to try to find another one. And I looked at those angry monsters all around and I thought, if this airplane just touches the edge of one of those things, the missions will end in the jungles of Central Africa and nobody will have a clue about what happened. And something else happened at that time. I have absolutely no memory. The next time we were high altitude, trying to keep Gina alive, thinking maybe she died and you know, am I gonna carry her home dead or am I gonna land in another country? And I'm um, hallucinating and scared to death. And then, and I'm writing the book, and for the life of me, I cannot remember. The next memory I have is that it was later that night, we were at 7,000 feet, perfectly smooth air over dense uh, black haze over Western Africa. The thunderstorms were gone, stars were out, and I have no recollection at all how we got from that place up there to where we were there. Funny. The book, it's called The Next Five Minutes. If you go on my webpage, you can push a little button and we'll give you a pre-order. It's supposed to be coming out pretty soon. I only had a handful of time to talk about it here, but we went into great details about a lot of things that happened around the world. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It's called the next five minutes. Any questions?